From South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on March 1st, 2024 in my American-made Dodge Durango. In our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., the capital, I'm on 15th Street here in Washington, D.C., Northwest, to be clear. In this episode, we close out the South Carolina 2024 Republican presidential primary with our final analysis from the Associated Press's Meg Kennard and South Carolina Public Radio's Mayon Schechter. Mayon also updates us on what we've been missing at the State House. And come along with me on the Super Tuesday Trail. That's right, we're following Nikki Haley up I-95. Oh, how you doing? Also, programming note. We'll recap all the Super Tuesday madness in Wednesday's pod on March 6th. That will be our only pod next week because your boy needs a vacation. <laughs> okay, I need to get out of here. The lead loves hearing from everyone. That's why we have a voice mailbox set up at 803-563-7169. Let me know if you're also in our nation's capital. You can let me know what you're doing if you guys are going on spring break, what you think about everything that's going on in our world. 803-563-7169. This is your time. This is our time. Give me a shout. But there's one more thing. If you don't want to call, you got to hit up the lead survey. That's right. We want to know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we're doing, you know, okay with. You can do that by letting us know at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org slash lead survey. Okay, let's continue on the trail with a bit of a recap from the primary. Awesome. I think there's still plenty to unpack here as it was years in the making, and then it all happened at once. So quick on Saturday, and we're all left like, what happened? Where are we? I know, I know. While I did bring you some analysis and clips from both Haley and Trump in Tuesday's pod, let's continue to digest this more and also get some more from the campaign trail (laughs) with friends of the pod, Meg Kennard and Mayon Schechter. I spoke with these two on This Week in South Carolina. Take a listen. Essentially, the numbers that we all saw, that's kind of what we expected. This sort of range of Donald Trump getting about 60, Nikki Haley getting about 40, that had been forecast. And so that was sort of in our minds. I think that, too, leading into that, the voters that we talked to and kind of hearing from them, a lot of people super supportive of Donald Trump, but then having some concerns among some of those GOP voters of the swirling legal situations or what have you. And then also coupled with that, Nikki Haley being this homegrown candidate, that's always been the factor of how much will that really affect her result. And I think from those numbers, we could ascertain there was still some support for Nikki Haley in her home state, but also understanding what we do about the numbers of new South Carolinians who are here since she was governor, kind of not really the overwhelming sort of numbers for her that some may be outside of South Carolina without the institutional knowledge of really what's been happening here for the last decade, maybe would have assumed her number would be higher. I think the end result is pretty much where we expected it to be. Meg, when we talk about that, we talk about your home state as a presidential candidate not winning that state. Obviously, things have changed since Donald Trump has gotten into the political arena. Does it matter as much these days when you don't win your home state like that? We didn't see her drop out. She already kind of massaged the messaging going into Saturday right. with her big speech on that Tuesday, saying, I'm going to stay in throughout, you know, whatever happens in South Carolina on to Super Tuesday. So doesn't seem to matter as much losing your home state. I think it is a different calculus when your home state is one of those early ones. And clearly when Chris Sununu had been thinking about getting into the race, being the governor of New Hampshire, we had that conversation all over again of, wow, he's from one of these early states. How will that really play? But two, I think, like you note, with Governor Haley's big speech of, it doesn't really matter what happens here. I'm casting forward anyway. I've already got these plans into Michigan and the Super Tuesday states. We didn't have any concerns there was going to be this last minute sort of dropout moment from her. But two, it really starts to add up and see with Donald Trump's so far, his dominance in this race, she's getting some delegates, sure, and some support. But at what point is that really kind of a make or break moment to mm-hmm. consider moving forward and, you know, pushing this campaign even further out? She's still in it for now, but, you know, Super Tuesday is not too far away. Yeah, we're so- certainly getting to that point. Maya, you covered some Trump activity before, and we're also in Columbia on election night with his watch party, his victory party. What stood up to you from that event? 
AP called that at like seven seconds after seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> polls right after polls closed. Yeah. You were there. He was on stage within minutes. Like we were like, okay, like we were off and running. <laughs> oh. What was it like out there? Uh, he had a lot of people on stage with him too. Well, it was probably the shortest I've ever heard uh, former President Donald Trump speak. It was an incredibly short event given the fact that AP called it so early. What really stood out to me was, one, the, the people who were there it was definitely a collection of Republican voters from not necessarily Richland County like we usually see at these Richland County Republican stops, but clearly from all over the state. What stood out to me from the former president was when he said, we are unified. This is a unified Republican Party. Um, I'm not sure if that's that's the right way to describe the Republican Party when there was booing at his own party event. And then obviously Nikki Haley has made a case that, no, we are not unified uh, at all. So that was probably the thing that stood out to me the most. Uh, the party, as as you know, quickly filtered out. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was it was the shortest celebratory party I've ever been to. Yeah, he was ask, asking uh, Governor McMaster if he could move up Election Day, which, you know, statutorily <laughs> cannot do. No. Right. Um, some interesting takeaways there, too. And he teased a little bit the the shift in the ch or the turnover at the RNC, um, and obviously at one point we thought Drew McKissick might be in the running, and and is not, but as chairman of the South Carolina Republican Party, so that was another piece that stood out mm -hmm. as well. We got a little bit of a of a more verbal preview of that shakeup. Mm -hmm. Meg, when we look at the early voting states and the polls, Trump was meant to win Iowa by what 53 points. He won by 30 points. New Hampshire by 18 points. He beat Nikki Haley there by 11 points. And in South Carolina, he was supposed to win by 28 points. Points, one by 20. You were in Michigan where he, uh, again, was supposed to win by 62 points and he was up by 42. So are these warning signs for Donald Trump, like we're talking about party unification, he's talking about the party being unified. Clearly there's not party unification. Obviously, as we get closer to a general election, everyone's supposed to come together and kumbaya, but what about right yeah. now, what we're seeing? Those are certainly some of the arguments that his supporters and surrogates are making, that the longer that Nikki Haley stays in this race, the more harmful that is for the overall Republican effort going into the general election campaign. Donald Trump, sure, he was talking about unity or at least sounding more like unity in South Carolina. That's not the message that we heard after New Hampshire. And so I don't think that we can necessarily say he is full on on the unity train at this point since there's been a little bit of undulation. But certainly from the Trump campaign's point of view, it would be better at this point if they were able to have the muscle of more of these also rands from the primary contest to include Nikki Haley, they would hope, to get behind him and say, this is what we're doing for the general election. Let's just focus on Joe Biden. Let's focus on getting the Democrat out of office. But I think that from those numbers, certainly polling is only a snapshot, and we say that all the time, but when you think about what it's perhaps forecast or thought of that Trump would be getting these sort of margins in these primary contests, and then the margins haven't been quite as big, that could indicate a lot of things, but one of them could be the theoretical notion when you ask a voter, hey, who are you thinking about supporting in this election? And then it actually coming down to that date, either them not showing up or perhaps changing their mind last minute. Voters can do whatever they want to. So I think there could be some of that at play. Clearly, we don't know exactly how much, but on behalf of the Trump campaign, they would certainly love to see those margins being even bigger mm -hmm. and also have more of that certainty headed into the general election that voters are really, really standing behind him. I also spoke more with Mayan about the latest State House news since we're still in session and I'm continually trying to catch up on all things Columbia. Mayan, I want to stick with you for a bit and look at some big issues moving through the State House. Obviously, we're coming up on March now, signing die last day of sessions, second Thursday in May. Not too long from now. I've, I haven't been in the state house as much, but what's going on uh, with some of the big bills moving forward, especially the open carry bill? Where's that mm -hmm. right now? So this is probably the closest in the time that I've covered the legislature that for the first time they could actually have open carry without permit. So constitutional carry or permitless carry actually pass. Mm. But it is uh, being held up over differences in the House and the Senate. So the House version was what they consider a clean version. The Senate made some changes. They stiffened some penalties for uh, felons who illegally possess mm -hmm. guns. They added um, some exceptions for lawmakers, for instance, to bring guns in areas that are maybe a bit more sensitive, courtrooms, maybe the state house. Mm -hmm. uh, they also put a provision in that would allow the state, since we're taking out the training piece or the permit piece, to have some state paid training throughout South Carolina so people could still access that. Mm -hmm. um, 
the ultra right or the far right conservative lawmakers in the House are are not really pleased so much with this exception for lawmakers. They consider that kind of a two tier system. And so there is definitely some Republican versus Republican fighting over this bill. This bill is right now in the negotiation phase between the House and the Senate. They did meet this week. Nothing happened, of course, because that's the way of conference committees <laughs> sometimes. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where this goes. I mean, Senator Shane Matthews, the Senate Majority Leader, obviously, has said, you know, these provisions that we tacked on were important to get this bill out of the Senate in the first place. Mm -hmm. So if they're removed, that obviously complicates the future of it. <clears throat> and meanwhile, McMaster has been very, very aggressive about wanting at least some bill to pass with this felony gun possession piece on it. And so he's been a lot more vocal about getting something done. Mm -hmm. So I, it's still, again, I, this is a popular thing that I like to say, but it like remains to be seen on this bill because yeah. we've seen efforts like this not come to fruition over slight disagreements. Yeah. And so, again, and as you mentioned, session ends in May, yeah. early May. And we've got the budget to move through as well, and that's moving right. in the House, and we'll see that debate happen more in mid-March. mid, mid -March. But really quickly, Mayon, medical marijuana cleared the state Senate like it did in 2022. It's now in the House. It's trying to get there right before the budget starts moving. Uh, what's what's the mood like in the House? Is it going to be shot down again? Is it going to actually have a debate? What, what do you think is going to be the trajectory? I think there are definitely a collection of Republicans especially, because that's really where it matters, right? Because because they control the House and have a supermajority that want to see this bill come back up and at least get a healthy debate on the floor, since, as we know, the bill never made it that far last mm -hmm. time. But look, if that bill comes up on the floor again, there's going to be thousands of amendments that especially Representative John McCravey, who's one of the more conservative lawmakers in the House, has promised he will make sure that this debate is, is lengthy with a lot of proposed amendments. Mm -hmm. The bill still hasn't come up in committee yet, in the House, you know, one of the big differences between last time and this time is the 3M committee was run by Democrats when that bill went through. Now it's run by Republicans, mm -hmm. so a completely different ballgame there. And they took out that revenue raising factor, which right. was the big holdup, which is how the bill got killed on technicality in right. the House in the first place. So. Mm -hmm. A lot to look forward to there. And anything else you're watching in 30 seconds? Uh, just that, uh, you know, there's a big um, DHEC. Yeah, mm -hmm. or, I'm sorry, judicial reform. Yeah. That's obviously something that's, again, big question mark. Uh, the House leaders today proposed universal school choice mm -hmm. bill, expanding the current law. That's also another thing that's up in the air. So a lot of different policies ping-ponging back and forth. All right, wonderful recap, sir. And we always love cannibalizing some This Week in South Carolina when I'm on the road. You can find that full episode on youtube.com slash South Carolina ETV or watch it every Friday night, 7.30, Sunday afternoon, 1.30 on ETV channels statewide. Now, as you heard at the top, we're following Nikki Haley's Sprint to Super Tuesday. She's set to hit about 10 states or so before the big day. And I'm here, I would say, more or less for a long-form project that I'm working on, but of course reporting on South Carolina's own homegrown candidate who continues to fight despite the long odds. It also gave me a great reason to drive up Interstate 95 and to see my mother. Aww. Now, Haley's post-South Carolina swing so far has included stops in Michigan, which voted on Tuesday, and the Super Tuesday states of Minnesota, Colorado, and Utah, some of the 15 states voting on March 5th, representing 874 delegates. She's previously visited California and will return to Texas on Monday. Now, I caught up with the campaign in Richmond and Washington on Thursday and Friday, respectively, and will hit up Raleigh on my way home on Saturday. But in Richmond on Thursday, I heard a different version of Haley's South Carolina stump speech, which I nearly memorized over two weeks. It's been since before February when I last heard Haley organically, not asked by a reporter, bring up abortion on the stump. Take a listen to what she's telling folks. The only way to have a federal law on abortion is you have to have a majority of the House, 60 Senate votes, and a signature of a president. We haven't had 60 Republican senators in over 100 years. We might have 45 pro-life senators. So no Republican president can ban abortions any more than a Democrat president can ban these state laws. So what can we do? We need to find consensus. Can't we agree to ban late-term abortions? Yeah. Yeah. 
Can't we agree to encourage adoptions and good quality adoptions? Can't we agree that doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? Can't we agree that contraception should be accessible? And can't we agree that no state law should say to a woman who's gotten an abortion that she's going to jail or getting the death penalty? Let's start there. No more demonizing this issue. We have to humanize this issue. And when it comes to what happened in Alabama, both of my children are from fertility. We need to make sure that every parent has access, and the decisions of what happens to those embryos should be strictly between the parents and the doctor, no one else. That was her before a crowd of some 400 people in the middle of the day in Richmond at a Westin hotel. Wow. Yeah, ever heard of Westin? Yes. Nice. And she had another rally at another Westin up the road, Interstate 95, in Tyson's Corner. Now, if you've ever driven to Washington or know anything about the area, you know that the Springfield Interchange, the Mixing Bowl, everything in Northern Virginia makes Malfunction Junction look like a joke. A freaking a joke, guys. It's nothing compared to this. Needless to say, I was already stuck in rush hour traffic, so I did not make that stop. But enough of my traffic woes. Haley also rallied these country club Republican types with the pragmatic messaging reminiscent of President Ronald Reagan and the party's modern foundations, which have given way to the party's current standard bearer, former President Donald Trump. This is about where exactly is the Republican Party going to go? Because that's what I'm looking at. The Republican Party used to be about fiscal discipline. It used to be about shrinking the size of government. But under Donald Trump, he put us $8 trillion in debt in just four years, more than any other president. Now, he loves to say that was because of COVID. Less than 20% was because of COVID. He didn't clean any of the agencies. He didn't shrink government. He grew it. And now what's happened? You see the Republicans are falling suit by opening up those pet projects. And then it used to be that the Republican Party believed in peace through strength. We always knew the more allies we had, the stronger we were together. And now Trump is pulling everybody away from that. And they're making it isolationist. And they're making you think that you have to choose between Ukraine and Israel or the border. That's just a lie. You don't have to choose that. That was another deviation from the South Carolina stump that I heard, but we are in a purple state, Virginia, not like ruby red South Carolina. However, like all Super Tuesday states, except Washington, not a state, but let's pretend for generalization purposes, Haley trails Trump by major numbers. We're talking like 53 points in California, 70 points in Texas, and 57 points in North Carolina, according to a poll in earlier February. But Haley continues to hit against the consolidation effort taking place at the Republican National Committee at the behest of Trump, the presumptive nominee. And then you look at what he's doing with the actual party organization itself. Now the RNC, before the primary's over, they're replacing the head of the the RNC with his daughter-in-law. His campaign manager is going to be director of operations. And they've now announced that the RNC is no longer about winning races up and down the ticket. It's about Donald Trump. Now, he has spent $60 million of his campaign contributions on personal court cases. And now the RNC is going to be his own personal legal fund. There's a resolution that has been put down that has said that you can't use the RNC for his legal fees. Now, the RNC, you have committeemen here. You've got three votes from Virginia. What I have said to the press, what I have said to anybody that will listen, we need to see those votes on the record. We need to see how every state votes when it comes to that. There you go. Some key points from Haley's closing arguments before Super Tuesday on abortion, which will be a huge general election issue come November the redefining of conservatism, and the future of the party. 
While the fundraising train continues to roll on, her campaign's three fundraising committees raised $12 million in February, which is down from $16 million in January. It will become more futile, and her staying in longer could start to hurt her future prospects. The writing will clearly be on the wall come next week. Haley has already lost six consecutive contests, and with the prospect of 15 more, the accountant in her may have to face some hard numbers, and the politician in her will have to face some hard truths as well. Alas, like the fundraising, the people are still enthusiastic. I spoke with several in Richmond who want her to stay in and keep fighting, including Susan Kiofila, who basically focused on some of those issues like abortion we just heard from Haley about. Take a listen. Being a, a veteran myself, her, and she's military spouse, she understands veterans. Too many people don't understand the issues veterans have. Her approach to abortion is important to me because I'm kind of in the middle between pro-life and pro-choice. And that's, I think, where the country needs to be. You know, there's reasons why some people need to have an abortion. My own daughter, she lost a baby, but it didn't pass, had to basically have an abortion in order for, uh, you know, to save her life. In Texas, she could have been arrested for that. So that's important to me. Ukraine, we cannot let Russia win in Ukraine. We need to do something about the border. I really like the way she approaches those issues and her, um, her perspective on those. Mike Balagatz was excited talking with me and looked at all this from a historic perspective. Yeah, America needs change, right? We all need change, and it's, it's time. Uh, we can't afford to have Joe Biden or Donald Trump. We need H Nikki Haley, and you know what? It's a very historic moment, and the first female U.S. president. And that'll happen next year. <laughs> hey, tell me what you think. Are you going to be voting for her on Tuesday, then? Have you already voted? Uh, no, I'll be voting uh, today uh, at our precinct. And uh, like I said, it's uh, very historic. I mean, I'm very privileged to be here. Um, historic is will be a first female U.S. president in hey, Mike, 2024. What do you like about Nikki Haley so much? What What did you hear from her today that really stood out to you? Oh, you know what? She 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 knows about our problems in the U.S. and um, you know she understands American people. We need change, and she's gonna bring it to us. Yeah, yeah. and I'm excited. Super Tuesday is on March 5th, and like we said, there are 874 delegates at stake there. Haley's campaign as of this taping has not advised any events beyond that date. We'll recap all the Super Tuesday madness in Wednesday's pod on March 6th. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news. We're glad you're here, A.T. Shire. I surprised you today. <laughs> <laughs> when you found out that I was not going to be in studio, let alone in the state of South Carolina. Yeah, that was that was a surprise to me and to many, I think. Uh, <laughs> but I, we're rolling with it. I had other work to do. You're not the only work that I have. I don't care so about you. I don't need I to don't be care. there. I, know. I don't care. I'm not driving. <laughs> I guess I told Amy, and then I was like, okay, well, that's enough. I, th I figured everyone's living in my brain, but apparently I'm not updating everybody. <laughs> it was fine. I had, I had a lot of other stuff to do. The fun thing's coming if you like history. Pods Everything and is shows. fun. For anyway, things. people, Gavin, let's get with it. We have a, uh, I would say, a scientific study, the results okay. of which have finally come in. And it has to do, I would say, tangentially with you on the trail. Yeah. Uh, we have a caller. She's going to advise you on how best to stay healthy on the trail, I think. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's, Are you ready? Yeah. I want to, health is wealth. Let us health know. Is health is wealth. Here we go. Wealth. Let's go. Hey, Gavin and AP. Um, as promised, baby's mama calling again to um, <clears throat> fill you in on how my AP chemistry class, what our calculations show today on the amount of Celsius that Gavin can safely drink um, without, you know, hurting himself or killing himself, really, is what we looked at. For this, we used the lethal dose, which is also known as LD50. This is the amount of a substance that you can take in that would kill 50% of a test sample. So if there's 100 people, they all drink this much, 50 of them would not survive. It's usually expressed in milligrams of the substance per kilograms of body weight. 
So for the purposes of our calculations, we pretended that Gavin is, I guess, 190 pounds. I didn't know what else to use for that. So we looked up cans of Celsius that the general version has 200 milligrams of caffeine in it per can. And the LD50 for caffeine that we found said 200 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So we had to convert pounds into kilograms and then figure out how many milligrams of caffeine it would take and then how many divide that by how much is in a can of Celsius. What we came up with was roughly 86 and a half cans of Celsius. And we put some more thought into this to make sure that we were thinking straight as to how quickly you'd have to drink this. The half-life for caffeine, that means the how much time it takes for half of the caffeine to be used up and go away, is about five hours. So I would say in about five hours, if you were to drink 86 and a half cans of Celsius, that would be enough to kill 50% of our sample of people. Shout out to my AP Chem kids who ran with this very well. I told them about the podcast. I even gave them my secret anonymous handle with y'all so they know who to listen for. So I hope that this is interesting for y'all. And if you have any questions, let me know. Well, there you have it. I need to drink 85 more cans of Celsius (laughs) today to see if I'm one of the 50 that will survive. Oh, that was something. Thank you, baby's mama, for that and the AP Chem class. Yes. Uh, that's some number crunching that I wouldn't even have thought to have done. So No, and, you're you're a big you're a big Celsius cruncher. You're a can cruncher. So well, you're I, my I numbers see, guy. You you yeah, and Kayla I'm have the, the numbers math brain. man on the pod. I'm the big well, idea, the abstract, yeah. the fashion. The fashion I mean, that fashion mostly. Mostly fashion. But uh I, I mean <laughs> the I, we gotta get we gotta get these numbers up, Gavin. Okay, uh, okay. Well I got I three in the car rolling around. If, if we've only, if we're getting single digits only in a day, and we need to like Ugh. eighty more than that, then okay. I mean, this is this is as close to getting struck by lightning as you'll ever get. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a challenge know, that you know, that. know I want. Oh, you know I how know. to bait me like this. I mean, well, you want it. You want to be struck by lightning and live. You also want to do the hundred nugget challenge. Oh. I feel like this is perfectly in the middle of that yes. Venn diagram. Honestly, I, if we have to drink this 86 cans in a five hour window too, which is going to be the hardest part. Mm-hmm. But I yes. feel like in order to we'll maybe... We'll cath you. Hey, we'll cath you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to get up. Um... <laughs> but then I, I feel like Uh, You know, whenever I start to stop shaking and I can actually eat food without choking, because it'll be shaking Mm -hmm. so much, then I can I can slowly start to come down by eating the the McNuggets, which will then probably still jack my heart rate up with all the sodium. So it's gonna be very difficult to really see. It might actually it will probably change your body chemistry and make you more electrically conductive. So you could maybe do all three things at once here. Three three birds, one stone. I would love that. I would love that. We need to do that. For sure. Anyway, Gavin, it looks like you're getting herringued by the the masses in yeah, DC. Yeah, people are, are, are complaining about my parking job, which I'm in a parked illegal spot, sir. You're the one who's <laughs> by the hydrant, so uh, give me a minute. I'm doing a podcast, bro. Okay, thank so chill you. Out. Yes. Well, anyway, wrap it up. Good luck. Get home safely, Gavin. All right. Thank you so much. And you guys can always leave us a message at 803-563-7169, like Baby's Mama did. Or you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love those, too. Oh, look, he found a way. Good for him. And you can also... Do... <laughs> it's a minivan. I'm not moving up for a minivan, baby. Oh, I'm not Jay Jackson's son for no reason. Also, you can do our lead survey at southcarolinapublicradio.org slash lead survey. We love that, too. You can always stay updated with the latest news on SCETV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. Move up five inches, man. Oh, rattling. Okay, no need to get an attitude. I'm not having an attitude. You are. Oh, okay. Bad parking and bad talking. Thanks.